video a deep look into the sublime playing of George Barnes. I came across a wonderful version of Gershwin's They Can't Take That Away From Me by George and Ruby Braff live at a concert in the, in the 70s I think and on that first listen I was like sort of instantly like I'm gonna transcribe this I wanna wanna learn this. Now you can download the uh, notation and tab from my website for free over at jazzguitarwithandy.com, link in the description and I'll put a pinned comment too. And we're gonna take a look at five ways and kind of why George's playing is so captivating in this particular solo. And one of the things that really appealed to me in this solo is that he plays like he's trying to tell a story, not being caught up in the ego of being a guitarist or a performing jazz musician. He's just trying to tell a story with, with the tools he's got. Now let's get into some of those intricacies of George's playing, and for me, he goes far beyond simply playing notes. Whatever recording you hear him on, he leaves his personal stamp. His voice is always present in his improvisation, and that's what we should all be aspiring to do. Learn to develop our own voice and way to, to speak over jazz standards. Now onto my first way that I think George's playing is so engaging and captivating, and that's his ability to extract feel from virtually every note he plays. One way George extracts feel is varying the way he plays the notes. So many instances with really musical phrases combined with lots of different techniques to ensure that he goes beyond simply playing the notes. Take the first few phrases and they're all call and response, but they're full of slides, you know, George's sort of um, sort of exaggerated slides that he liked to do, uh, staccato notes, vibrato, bends, half-step bends, so, you know, there's lots going on. You know, the call starts in bar two. So in that, we've got a slide into this G, and into the, into the C, then a, uh, a staccato B flat there, which gives that sort of contrast between those two notes. Then a bend, a, a half step bend, which is so bluesy. A bit of vibrato on the E flat. Yeah, it's quite a lot of vibrato for a jazz context, but I like it. The response to that is really similar, packed full of technique. He just closes it off with a different note. But even that tailing off with the slide to nowhere is pretty cool at the end there. Just, you know, again, more effect, more interest to just going beyond simply playing the notes. This adds to the feel of the solo. The third phrase which follows on that, he brings in his exaggerated slides. And for me, you know, you have to dig in quite a to get them to work. That's how he gets them to work, and obviously you have to travel quite a way for that to work. I can imagine they're not everyone's cup of tea. For me, I really like them. I think they're fun, and they're kind of his signature sound. You, you hear it right through his career. For me, George really pulls the audience in here. You can tell in the performance everyone's really into it. And he does it through, like I said, extracting the feel from all the notes with all these technique, which you know makes it like a human voice, if you like. It gives it character. If I played it without any of the technique, let's see what it would sound like. Um, would it be as effective? Well, it sounds quite bland, doesn't it, in comparison? Uh, so it just goes to show, you know, you know, a slide here or there, a bit of vibrato, 
staccato note, those sort of things. And, you know, you can't go too far with some of these techniques. Sometimes it is down to personal taste. But, you know, when you're soloing and, and you're coming up with ideas, try and think, oh, how could I get some more from this? And it's often through adding in little techniques just to give it some more emotion, if you like. The solo has quite a broad dynamic range. You know, you've got mellow, soft phrases. <laughs> to the, you know, accented notes, or the, up there, you know, where he digs in a little bit more. But there's certainly, you know, he's not playing at one volume. You listen to him play that solo, it's, 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 it's changing quite a bit. Sometimes subtly, but it does have an effect. You know, a soft bend like this, compared to, you know, it has a very takes on a very different character. And uh, the other technique I feel that really comes across and adds feel is his use of bends. Uh, you know, he played on a lot of blues music as well, particularly early on in his career, and never afraid to use bends. And, uh, you know, in a jazz context, typically, you know, a half step or a quarter step bend is typically regarded as being acceptable to most people. Um, most people wouldn't go further than that. But in this particular solo, they have, you know, they really help add character. You know, all the, you know, there's even, there's even a unison bend in it. You know, all that. It's a bit dirty, isn't it? Sounding a bit gnarly and, you know, adds interest. And, it, and just the bends. Like that. That could have been. But instead it went. It's a bit more to it. A bit more interest. The second thing I really like in this solo is this building of tension through an ascending line. Now, in bars 9 to 12, we get this, where he gets the line uh, which goes... Which, for me, it really builds tension because, first off, in the listener, in the audience, it creates that interest of, whoa, they're going up, they're going to run out, where are they going to keep going, how far are they going to go? You know, it's kind of, if something keeps going up and up and up, it's got to fall back down or, or stop at some point. So, it kind of, like, generates interest just for that very basic reason for me. Um, the other thing that's cool about it is, dynamically, he increases the volume as he goes up. Uh, <laughs> You know, it's hard to probably capture on the camera as, as well as I'd like, but... And again, going back to my first point, you know, that could have been... But he slides into every note on the B string, puts some vibrato on the E string. So there's a lot more going on than just playing the notes, and in fact, if he did just gone... Uh, it sounds fine, there's nothing wrong with it obviously, but it sounds a bit bland uh, when you know what it could have sounded like with all that technique in it. So, you know, ascending lines are a really helpful way to create tension, add interest to your solos. They require you to kind of obviously, on the guitar we often learn scales and arpeggios going this way, when you really need to know them as well, go... So bars 9 to 12, it's a really simple construct. It's just having a line which moves up the neck. But it's kind of, again, like call and response. Ba -da -da, call, response, da -da -da. you know, as it goes up, each idea responds to the next. So, you know, it's full of many musical, you know, traditions here. My third observation in this wonderful solo is what I like to call blitz in the B. And using the structure of the song to tell your story over it. Now... The move to the B section in this song sees like George shifting gear, he puts his foot on the gas and we get a greater intensity with more notes, uh, faster rhythms, less rests and for me it has a great effect on the listener because it uses the structure of the song, you know, in this instance A-A-B-A -A -A, and the change in feel in this particular song because it, it goes to sort of a minor feel in this section and he's really outlining that change but also it takes the listener on a journey. It ends up that his solo has a beginning, a middle and an end. You know, with the A section being the beginning, the, the B section where he goes, you know, a little bit frantic if you like, you know, the middle, and then we pull it back and close things off with the end, with the A section. So the B section starts off with this, you know, triplet line. 
Um, He's also, you know, gone for a harmonic minor here to, to you know, for a different feel for this section too. But just thinking about, you know, simply, you know, get, changing to triplets, which he has used in the first two A sections, but not as explicitly as this maybe. A little trill there. No, more triplets. And then he's got this pedal point line here. Which is cool, so you're playing a D and then descending other notes against it. D, C, B flat, A, G, F sharp. It's a, a G harmonic minor descending. So that there, those just those first few bars is a massive stream of notes. Right, right up until that point, that's just one massive chunk there, which, you know, it does, you know, not having any real rests and the change in rhythm, it just does go, whoa, you know, if you were listening, it would be completely different from, you know, all the nicely phrased and sweet sounding stuff. It's suddenly like flick a switch, off we go, let's change, change the feel and it works really effectively. So one thing you can do, use the form of a song to try and form, inform how you play over it, you know, maybe try going phrased over A sections and then B section trying to bring out, you know, uh, either a constant stream of eighth notes, triplets, or even sixteenth notes, just playing with a bit more intensity, and then go back to the A section and pull it back. And I think really you experience this when you play with live musicians rather than playing at home to backing tracks or to your looper, because maybe naturally people will do that, or hopefully the people you're playing with will go with you on that sort of story, like, you know, the, the rhythm guitar certainly does does here. Fantastic rhythm guitar play, player, by the way, on this track. And one thing I think I really like about this solo is he plays one chorus, just one chorus. And I think that, if anything, it means everything has to count. You know, you have some sort of live jazz situations where a player might even take 10 or 11 choruses, which, you know, one thing, it's amazing that he can continue to keep making ideas and structure it. But I think when you're just playing over once over the form, you know, you can deliberately make more of a story of it and take the listener maybe on more of a journey. Whereas maybe, you know, if you've got, you know, 10, 11 choruses to solo over, you're probably just trying to think, oh, how do I, what else can I do? You know, it's, it's, it's tricky. So for me, he's using the form of the song to help structure his solo, playing to the song, if you like, you know, and the consummate musicians that he's got around him obviously go with him and help him tell that story too. After that blitz in the B, we return to another A section. He returns to more sort of, spaced phrasing if you like more rest more call and response sort of ideas the takeaway from this bit is that the form of the song is there to help you use it here like george does and your solos will have structure so for me this next thing i'm going to highlight is something i think maybe he got from brass players probably trumpet players in that george takes one note and really emphasizes it now this happens several times in the song i think emphasizing one note again over and over and and george does this throughout the solo is something probably a lot of us guitar players are a bit scared of we always feel like we need to be playing more notes like we feel this sort of we feel compelled to be you know moving around the fretboard and playing as much as possible when you know really you can find everything in one position on the guitar you know that you should need and emphasizing one note can be more powerful than playing many notes it's just you have to be creative with how you do it and rhythm like in this instance can really help with that there's a number of times in this solo where he emphasizes one note often the, the key note which you know this song's in the key of e flat and he picks out this e flat in bar seven it is just like that you know that's not something you overly think to do but it it has effect after he's done all this that comes after a lot of you know not the nice phrasing <laughs> It's kind of like, whoa, okay, that's a little bit different. It's, it reminds me of a trumpet player when they do like a stab with the, you know, something that really just capture interest and the audience's attention. It also happens in bar 15. He does this sweep of an E flat major arpeggio, then emphasizes the E flat on the top. Which is pretty cool and really makes that keynote stand out. Bar 29, we get that, you know, again, that's something personally I wouldn't necessarily think to do. But you know, that's the sort of thing, you know, if a, a trumpet player did that, it would really, really sound impactful. And there's no reason we can't sort of borrow some of those ideas. I do think a lot of these uh, earlier players tended to learn more from other instruments than maybe uh, more contemporary 
jazz guitar players who maybe learnt more from guitarists. I think they had more of a love for you know the brass greats and um, the ways that they played. And because they obviously have to to breathe to play, they're not playing all the time, and they're sometimes more creative maybe than you know when on the guitar we can just keep playing all the time, which isn't necessarily a good thing, you know. And one note really stands out in this whole thing: bar thirty, where he goes like that. This uh, C up here. Like almost BB King star, you know, like you would do in something like The Thriller's Gone or something. But again, you know, just go for me. It's the last note on the on this particular as well, and it really does. Whew, you know, it's obviously it's higher. It will stand out to the listener, and that emphasis of one note is something is really simple, but can be really effective to uh, you know contrast against phrases with more notes and more movement. Final thing I'd like to pick out is his use of sweeping. This occurs several times in the solo, just before the B section. He goes. There's a C minor to a C minor six. So C, E flat, G, then C, E flat, A. And then uh, towards the end we have the that, this D flat and uh, 13 uh, sweep as well. There's also the um, E flat major seven, sorry, E flat major arpeggio, he does it too. And, you know, what's the effect of using this this sweeping? Well, it's not something he uses extens extensively. There you go. There's the three instances in the in the entire form where he uses it. But what it does do is obviously it gives a quick, a very different technique. Going through notes quickly contrasts with the other stuff which is going on. Like that. And I just think it's it's another technique to uh, just vary the way that he's approaching and playing these notes. So that was my thoughts on this wonderful solo and things I think we can learn from George and try to incorporate in our own playing. Now if you want to learn it, you can learn it too. Download the tab and notation for free from my website, link in the description and in the pinned comment. Let me know what your thoughts are on this solo. If you have any questions about it, then, then do leave them below. If you'd like to learn more about George Barnes, then I have made a similar video about his approach over the song Lover Come Back To Me, so uh, I'll put that on the screen. Join me every Wednesday and Saturday for jazz guitar lessons, so please be sure to subscribe, hit that notification bell to be informed of my next lesson. Until next time.